You all right? My name's Paul. I've got autism and I make random videos based on my version of autism and the way my head works. And I stick the videos on the internet in case you fancy giving them a watch. And this is my Dark Side of Autism series that I've decided to do where I'm picking on parts of autism which are not always fun, happy, shiny and friendly because people like me feel the dark side of autism, the negative sides. And one of the big problems with society is you're just not allowed to be negative. You know, like, look at the world, look at the state it's in, look at the mad things humans do to each other on a daily basis. But when you say it, it's like, oh, don't do that, that's negative. It's weird, but um, I want to try and wrap my head around what I consider the curse of a late diagnosis of autism. Um, because obviously the internet is riddled with people with autism and, you know, rightly so, you know, I'm not knocking anyone for doing what I'm doing, for example, but there's a lot of people who have had it a lot easier than people like me. And I'm not after sympathy or anything like that. You know, I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, people who have a, an earlier diagnosis, it can be a big help. And it can also be a big hindrance, just like a late diagnosis. But I want to talk about late diagnosis because, um, you know, you do get left behind. You are not as welcome in autism communities, which are uh, not always what they're made out to be, too. So it's a weird feeling knowing that there was a reason that you felt like you were on the outside of life. You know, feeling like why you could never fit in with anyone, why there was never that connection, because that's, you know, you just miss, you just miss that connection with a lot of people, or at least I have. That's something I've had to uh, deal with my all my life. I've just never seen the interest in certain things that everybody else sees an interest in. I don't find funny what everyone else finds funny, and it's just an out of sync feeling, and it was never never good. So when you get the, you know, go, go through life and like I was, I was about 34 and I got my late diagnosis, which I know isn't late for some. Some people have got diagnosed in the 70s. I get that. But there's also a huge difference from being diagnosed when you're five to being diagnosed when you're 34. I didn't get, you know, even if I was diagnosed at five, there wasn't the schools that are specialist for autism like there is now there wasn't the care, there wasn't the assistance, there just wasn't those sorts of things when I was, you know, in the 80s, for example. So I would have, like in my school, we had a bunch of people who um, were not, you know, neurotypical, if that's the word to use. There was a difference within a few of them. And instead of having teaching assistants that you can have today, they were just all put on table five, which was the table for the different kids, you know, so it's still the same class, but they were just kind of banded together. <laughs> you know, that was their way of dealing with it. It was like, look, you know, there isn't anything else. This is it. Um, I don't know if that was indicative of the poor area I was from or if that's just how it was, but I never got, I think what I'm trying to say is when you're diagnosed younger, there are more things available now. There are more things, there was more things available 10 years ago. You know, there was, there was the option of things. There was the consideration of things. There's help now to get autistic people into work. There are support groups. There are online classes and all sorts of things now, whereas there was nothing like that when I was a kid. But then at the same time, I've also had to force my way through situations because I didn't know why I was different. You know, so at least I've experienced a bunch of things which a lot of other autistic people won't because I've I had no choice because there wasn't anything to use to say back then, you know. But I'm just gonna keep going round in circles. I know I will. So, like I say, there is a good side of being diagnosed later. It's not all doom and gloom, but there's still a curse to it, and I'll get to the curse, you know, at the end kind of thing. So, you know, the good the good reasons is it brings you a personal acceptance. Like what I didn't get 
is I didn't get what a lot of other people seem to have where it was like this euphoria moment where the light bulb goes on and they say, everything makes sense. I didn't get that. I just had a guy tell me he was autistic. I left the place. I'm walking, you know, and I remember thinking, now what? What do I do now? What's the difference? I don't, you know, do I have to? I, I just couldn't figure out what I was meant to do with this. But then at the same time, I just knew I was different, but never knew why. I never put a second's worth of investigation into why either, whereas a lot of people will do a lot of research, think it's autism, go to a specialist after a referral and uh, come out with a diagnosis. And that's, I think, where it makes a bit of sense for them. But, um, you know, that can help you move forward for some people because they can always know they were different and never have an answer as to why and now they've got one great now i can move forward at least i understand why i feel different and that's great for those people but you know there's there's a bad side to it as well you know like i said you know i've forced my way through situations in life where i would have loved to have avoided i would have loved to have never been a part of them loved to have been a million miles away from that stayed at home but instead, you know, the trauma that a lot of people talk about within autism, you know, I've, I've suffered the trauma. It could have been avoided. I could have, I, I could have looked after myself better and not broke down as easy and not burnt out and not had the meltdowns. I could, have, I could have missed a lot of that if I'd have had an earlier diagnosis. And it does all take its toll. I, do, I, I personally believe there's a finite, level of resilience within all of us especially people with autism especially me you know i'm very resilient but only so far and the one thing i've noticed through age and the things that keep happening and you know attacking on me battling at my resistance wall is the wall gets weaker and things get through quicker and it's not a nice feeling you know um you know and the like up until my diagnosis and even now, you know, I, because I, I didn't know what made me different and I've had the fallouts, the fights, the disagreements, the lost jobs, the missed opportunities, all those things that have come along with it is I just never found my place in the world. Whereas today you'll go on Instagram and there'll be 19 year olds and they're posting things about autism and the things that they want are what I call privilege problems. And I'm not having a go or taking the mick. I'm saying they are because people are really like, oh no, you're, you're saying adult with autism. What you should really say is I'm an autistic adult because you should put the identity before the person. But mate, I, you know, I've been punched in the face. I've, you know, been kicked. I've lost the jobs. I've, you know, been near on homeless. You know, I've had struggles because I didn't know I had autism. I just always knew there was a difference, never knew why, and other people could feel the difference and attacked me for it. I've had real problems, so don't you fret or worry yourself because I put adult with autism instead of autistic adult. You know, that is something so far down the line that if I had nothing else to be worried about, to stress about, be concerned about, you know, and I use this analogy all the time, but it's like people who focus on how you use your cutlery, you know, like you should never turn your fork so it's face, so it's face up. You should never put your elbows on the table. If you've got headspace to be concerned about things that trivial, then you're clearly doing all right. You know, I, it's like people are still talking about how they want to rebuild a building and what color they're going to put on the walls while I'm still looking at this building in a raging inferno and I've got to put a fire out. So it's like I see the serious, deep nature of things and people are just looking at the very superficial things to, you know, polish when it's done. They want to put the candles on a cake before the cake's been made. And that's another reason why autism will never move forward in rectification because people keep diverting, you know, resource in thought to the few and not the many. And that's a problem as well, but probably another topic for another time. You know, but one of the other one of the curses of being diagnosed later is that you are just now expected to carry on. And, you know, you've had autism for so long. So what's the problem? Now you just know what you've got. 
And that brings problems because imagine you're acting every single day of your life and you don't know why you're acting. You just know you've got to. You know you've got to be a certain way to maintain the status quo. You don't want to upset anyone. You don't want to upset the equilibrium of the atmosphere that's around you. You want to make sure you don't draw attention to yourself, but you don't appear too distant. You have to play this perpetual game, this motion of existence where you play everything to your design. So when you actually get a diagnosis, one of the first thoughts you have is, maybe I don't have to do that anymore. That'd be great if I can just take my foot off the gas and I can be a bit more me. That'd be blissful. You know, I've, I've got insomnia. And I think one of the reasons I have insomnia is because I, I, I need more hours in a day to think than there are actually hours to figure out how I'm going to be for every second of the next day and how I'm going to account for even the most unforeseen circumstances. You know, it's like when people, what, what I mean by that is like when people go out and they go to a restaurant, you know, they, they go in, they, they get seated by the person and then they've got to choose the food. But when I walk into a place, I've already, like one of the first things I do is want to go to the toilet the second I get there. And sometimes I don't even need the toilet. It's to scout the exits. <laughs> because what I don't want to do is go out the same way everybody else is trying to get out if something's to go wrong. So, And that's how I have life. I, I am always one step over general consideration. So when you get diagnosed later, you want to be able to take your foot off the gas and mentally not have to prepare. For every scenario, you want to be yourself just a little bit more. But you do get that, you, you kind of don't get that um, luxury afforded to you because acceptance is very temporary from other people because, you know, if, you, if, you, if your child was two years old and it was acting up and you couldn't understand why it wasn't, doing as you asked or why it wasn't speaking or whatever, you know, pick a, pick a, pick something which would upset a parent, you know, and then you get your child with a diagnosis of autism. A lot of people have a sigh of relief and they're like, that's why now at least we've got a reason. And then they raise that child accordingly. But when you're an adult and you want to take your foot off the gas and you've been diagnosed, nobody wants to afford you that attention it's kind of like, like I say, acceptance is temporary. It's like, all right, you know, you've, you're now autistic. So why do you also have to change just because you're autistic now? You know, what's changed? And it's like, I don't, I, I'm not changing. I just want to be more me. I've been fake forever for your benefit. And now I just want to be me. But you've got a problem with that because I've changed. I haven't changed. I just want to be me. Why is that a problem? And that's. Not nice because it's kind of like you've still got to be a different person for everyone else so you don't draw attention to yourself. And a late diagnosis doesn't afford you the freedom of being yourself. Not for me anyway. You know, and people wonder why you change and it makes people respond negatively and friends, you know, are like when I've told a few people who were more acquaintances, I've not spoken to some of these people since. And I've known them for 20 years. It's like, why now do you not talk to me? Why is it now a problem just because I don't want to do certain things I used to force myself through? You know, and I know family and friends can shun people. Some people don't want to hear the word autistic. But in reality, especially when you are older, one of the bonuses is you can just get rid of the people you don't want around you because they are negative. I understand it's harder when you're younger and under their roof and they're paying the bills i know that would be much more difficult but then when you're older as well you also have it's like it's the, the whole agenda of autism is driven by younger people than me and like i said i'm not accepted in autism communities because i think differently and instead of that being accepted because they should know how that feels you know, they think differently to the general population. So they create a community and then I pop up and go, I also think different, but I do think different to you too. Can I still be part of it? And I get shouted at, attacked, bullied, you know, kicked out, blocked, uh, which is 
weird because you'd think artistic people would understand how it feels to treat people like that. But I digress. <laughs> but because the agendas are driven by younger people, they have now taken a big dislike to high-functioning autism. That saying, and they've created reasons why that's not a good thing to say. And now people refer to it in function levels and need support, but they don't work for me. High functioning autism does, and I've explained in a video before why it does. People have told me why I'm wrong for that, but please remember my opinion versus your opinion, nobody can win because they're just opinions. Like, you know, football teams, which is your favorite football team? It might be different to mine. No one's right, they're just opinions. But we have to abide or fall in line with how people, other people think outside of me and it doesn't work. So we have to get late diagnosed and be told we have to identify with functions and labels that don't actually fit because, you know, function labels and need support are very good for younger people, not people who've already had a go at life and hit brick walls here, there and everywhere. Um, and I think one of the things, what are great things, someone pointed out to me just how far we are from giving adult autism any ounce of credence is they attended a course, um, which was kind of like a way for late diagnosed autistic people to find their way a little bit and uh, maybe reach out, have a, you know, like a bit of a distance communication with people. So a bit like, I suppose, having a, a WhatsApp group, you know, where, or a kick group or whatever, where you would just have as a place to vent, ask a question, see how people are feeling. Um, and when they went, this person in the room was like, look, there's an app for your phone and it's a great app. It's good for autism. It's great for communities. And, you know, people were good, happy about that. Except the older people, because they still had, you know, if they had a mobile phone, it was just a simple mobile phone. That wasn't a smartphone. And if they did have a smartphone, they need help with installing apps and knowing how they work. So even to try to help adults with autism who've been diagnosed later, they're thinking of today's technology instead of the person who might not use it because they are different and why would they want to? You know, being asocial, like I am, why would you need to keep up with the times on how to communicate with people effectively? So, you know, that, that's a bother as well, isn't it? And, I, and one of the things which I really dislike is a bit like what I was talking about with acceptance. And even the government, don't accept your late diagnosis with any ounce of credence. That'd be nice because what they do is they say things like, like if I was to apply for PIP, the personal independence payment, which, you know, I should because my eating habits are driven by my autism. My issues with food are driven by my autism. So I have a more expensive cost of living for how I eat. So I should be able to get a little bit of a, you know, supplement to balance my cost of living which is autism driven i would love a weighted blanket but they're about 200 quid for the one for the size of my bed i ain't got 200 quid to just waste on a piece of fabric but if i had assistance i would save that to buy it you know i wouldn't just be getting a little bit of extra money to save and go on holiday with or something like that it would all be used for that reason a blue disabled parking badge I've put a lot of thought into it. You know, I've always thought in my head, you know, in a very primitive way, it's like, look, it's a disability badge. The bays are at the front of the shop. So it's people with mobility issues. That's who they should be for. But one of the things I've noticed what I do very often with part of the sort of type of work I do is I have to travel a lot. Obviously that's in a car for me. Um, sometimes I'll fly, you know, I don't mind, uh, in-country travel it's a lot easier to do than uh, going abroad and still needs a hire car at the end of it you know and uh it's parking i have a huge huge issue with parking i really hate parking i just it's it's not the parking up that's the problem it's knowing where to park and what i found is a lot of places in an area i used to work was all zone parking or disc parking and you needed 
something on your dashboard to explain or display why you were allowed to park there. And I haven't got them because I'm not from them areas. So I would, and I've got such a fear of being late. You know, I cannot be the one who lets people down. And, um, you know, I've, I've even considered going to the doctor because of the stress and the anxiety and the worry that it causes if I can't find somewhere to park that, you know, I wouldn't then use a disability badge to park at the front of a shop because I still would give it up for people who are much more in need of that than I am. But I have a fear. I have an anxiety, a stress, which is all I assume linked through my autism of why I can't be late and why I've got to at least acknowledge to people I'm here. I am here. I'm just going to be another 10 minutes, you know, because um, I've just had to, I've got to find somewhere now to park and I'm not from the area and that information isn't readily available. But what you find is the late diagnosis, it's more of a, you, you get a vibe which is very, well, look, you've, you've coped so far. Why can't you just carry on? You know, why do you now need assistance? It's like, no, you absolute clown. How can't you get this? I haven't just been floating through life normally, laughing and joking with carefree environments around me. And now I've got autism, so now I want these considerations. I've been trying 10 times harder every second of every day just to make it home again, just to be able to keep my head above the water, just to not crumble and crack. I put in systems all over the place just to do everyday life. Now all I'm saying is I just need a little bit of assistance which might lighten my load. And this late diagnosis should help that. Nope, they don't listen because it's a case of, well, you've done it forever. Why can't you carry on doing it? You know, so you feel like you become a burden in a way. It makes you feel like you're a burden. It makes you feel like you, you know, you can feel the, you know, when you go to employers and you ask for reasonable adjustments now and you never did before, you can feel them sort of thinking you're trying it on and why do you need it now? Get over yourself. Stop trying it on. Stop making out you're worse than you are. Uh, you've no idea what I do. You know, that mask you wear is burdensome the older you get. You know, uh, it's, it's horrible because people just expect you to carry on because it's more convenient for them. What about you? What about the person with autism? What about the person who's had to deal with it forever and they just want a modicum, just a small moniker of something back? They're not asking for, a, you know, the tables to turn and have everybody bow and bend to their need. It's just accept I've got it, accept it's a difference, and accept that if I am a bit more blunt now, if I choose not to laugh at your joke, if I don't want to come for a beer after work, if I don't want to come to a Christmas do, you know, if I don't want to shake your hand because I have always really had a problem with touching people, you know, if I now go, oh, sorry, mate, I don't do that, but it's really nice to meet you. You know, if I say that instead, let that be all right. But people just, it's more convenient for others if you just keep your mask on and crack on. It's more convenient for others if you just pretend you never got that diagnosis in the first place and you didn't have autism. It's more convenient for them and not for you. And you're the one who suffers for it and it's not fair. You know, the real world, the reality is, you know, it's good PR to pretend that you're interested in autism. It's good PR to pretend that as a company, you're really invested in your employees and you really want to make sure people like me are well considered and well thought of and actually given a platform where we feel comfortable to uh, talk openly. But the private person is very different. You know, privately, you know, it doesn't sell. That's why TV shows about people like me, like you probably, if you're watching, you know, if you're at my... If you're, if you're in my camp of autism, if you're at my point on the spectrum, we don't sell good TV because we haven't got a quirk that's strong enough for people to latch on to. We haven't got a great story to tell. It's negative. It's hard. It's bounty. You know, it's just so strong in what went wrong, what could have been better. That's why a lot of people are laced in depression with autism because they've just had enough that resilience is finite and they've used theirs we don't sell you know 
it's just not fair because the focus on young people is great, but young people also get older. And the late diagnosis of us is hard. You know, and if you think about it, you know, the people out there with a late diagnosis could have always tried to fit into societal norms like I did. And but the difference is, whereas I knew I could not have children because it would have been too much for me in how I need to live. And I stuck to my guns with that. There are people out there with autism who've now, you know, have got families who are married or have had kids and they're divorced. And then they get an autism diagnosis. It's already done, isn't it? You know, they've followed career paths because it was expected, forced through families. And it might be something they absolutely despise doing with every fiber of their being. But they did it because it was easier than to deal with people kicking off all the time at them. But now they're older and they don't have to listen to that. They're still in a job they absolutely despise. Some people will have financial burdens around their neck that they wish they would never have had, like a mortgage, for example. Now they've got to pay the mortgage until the last day on earth. And uh, it wasn't something maybe they would have done if they hadn't have got the diagnosis a lot later in life. When I think of the amount of bridges I've burnt, the amount of situations I've been in that I have ruined, the fallouts, the fights, the missed opportunities, because of autism, they're not good either. You know, the situations that I could have avoided, but didn't. The things I found myself in that I knew were, were detrimental, but I did them anyway because it was for acceptance. It wasn't, you know, when you see people in gangs and they just, because they're a bunch of insecure people, they want to appear cooler to the people that are standing around. It wasn't like that for me. It was, I just didn't want to stand out. So I would do things just to break the, the even, you know, just to break even all the time. And, you know, again, a, a late diagnosis, the one thing that's there for a lot of people is, oh, I've told you before, but I shake. I've got these tremors, essential tremors in, in like my hands. And, you know, I'm, I'm reclusive to the point where nothing is a good idea to leave the house. Nothing at all. You know, I've got insomnia, something rotten, and I'm going through it at the minute, and it's horrible. Because I'm lying awake thinking of nothing but negativity. You know, I've had I've had relationships, and some people will say, "Oh, at least you've had relationships," and but they've been toxic. They've been bad. Some have been, you know, okay. I'm not going <laughs> to knock everyone I've ever been in a relationship with, but some of them have been absolutely volatile and horrible. Which, and I was in them because I thought that's what you do. You just get in relationships because that's what's expected of you. You know. And, you're also seen by some as a liar, a user, that you're deceptive, that you're manipulative, you're sly, you're fake. But all those things, the reasons you're doing them is because you're just trying to fit in. You're just trying to break even, but you don't get afforded the luxury of being yourself. So you have to be those things or it will upset the people you're actually trying to be fake for so they don't feel bad. And the problem with all those things is they are a curse because there is no going back the damage is done you know like i say the failed relationships you can't fix them people who are in who've been married and divorced and they're paying a fortune for child support and they don't even get to see the kids and they're in a one-bedroom flat in a job that they hate there's no going back there is a genuine curse to being diagnosed late with autism and i just wanted to talk about it to put a limelight on it because companies out there don't want to but anyway, I hope it made sense and you know why I've done it. And until next time, thanks for watching and keep smiling.